It's not calling you Josh Frydenberg, it's calling you Dosh Frydenberg. Under the coalition, taxes for hard-working Australians will always be lower. You know, I, I don't hold a hose, mate, and I, I don't sit your control room. They're answers that only can come from Victoria, I'm afraid, because that's not my job. But I ain't spending any time, though, because in the meantime, every three months, a person is torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. Well, g'day, listeners, and welcome to The Two Jacks, the very first episode of 2023, and we wish you all a very happy new year, although it is the 10th of January, uh, and that might just be a little bit late for those kinds of salutations. Jack, how are you today in hot, all the way in Hong Kong? I'm good, mate. Excellent. A COVID sufferer, I believe. Uh, I, I think I did have a little dose between Christmas and New Year, yes. Oh, dear, oh, dear. So what is the situation like in Hong Kong? Well, we're all sitting back expecting to have a, a series of doses of COVID, really. Um, uh, we, uh, the, the general belief is that it's going to sweep through the city a couple of times as it, saw, as it will China in, uh, as well. Um, the, the border opened on Sunday, right. uh, January 8th, um, uh, and there were, there's a 55,000 uh, quota of people who were allowed to pass in either direction, one direction or the other. What restrictions are on them, Jack? Do they have to have a, a negative rat? They have to have a, a negative PCR test. Mm. Um, but as it turned out, they didn't, they didn't fill the 55,000 quota. Um, I think uh, 45,000 crossed the border on Sunday, uh, 33,000 were Hong Kongers heading to the mainland and 12,000 back the other way. So zero COVID, dynamic zero COVID is over in China, is it that right? It is indeed over. And in fact, they dropped the thing so quickly that the Hong Kong government has been scrambling around in a rather unseemly fashion uh, to try and catch up with uh, the news from across the border. There was a, a particular province, one of the more populous uh, provinces in China, that, where, that, 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 where the, the official line was that 80% of uh, 80% of the population had been positive for COVID had come in contact with COVID, I think was the, was the, uh, was that Hen in? Um, and, um, and, and, and so it looks like the place is absolutely just bursting, bursting with COVID at the moment. In yeah, China. there's been there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of rumours, as always, with Chinese matters about what the Chinese government was doing and why the sudden dropping of the of the zero, dynamic zero COVID. Um, and I think probably the most likely explanation is that the the virus had gotten beyond their control, that the lockdown, that the, you know, the extreme lockdown process was no longer working. And that's that's what history tells us, all those lockdown processes do, whether they're in Victoria or in China, is just kick the problem down the road a little bit. Um, uh, and, and that the, the virus had escaped from their control and it was going to overwhelm the place. So the best thing to do was to drop the dynamic zero COVID policy say we were facing new challenges and get out before but the policy looked completely foolish. Well, I guess the, the major driver is the economy, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, we always we always wonder and worry a little bit about China's economic figures, but their growth figures are pretty ordinary. And isn't it that surely there must be a view within the CCP that they've just got to, got to kick the economy in the guts and get it going? Well, I think there were two things. I think there were the politics of not wanting to look like they had been defeated by COVID, um, firstly, and secondly, they needed to get the economy up and going again. And and to be frank, getting rid of dynamic zero COVID and opening up the country and the economy is not just good for China, it's good for the rest of us as well. Very, very good in terms of those supply chains, uh, manufacturing supply chains around the world, affecting Australia to this day. Um, but you mentioned that... Uh, a, a test was required for entry from the mainland into Hong Kong. And, and vice course, versa. And, and vice versa. So why would the Chinese be unhappy with Australia and other countries for insisting that uh, travellers from China uh, are, required to, uh, are required to provide a negative test for COVID uh, before well, they enter? I think that plays well politically at home. That's it. So, so it's just a bit of politics, really. Um, there was a bit of jumping up and down. The announcement was made in Australia uh, oh, a week or so ago now, and there was all but silence from uh, from China 
for a couple of days and then there was a fair bit of foot stomping after that. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I, I don't think that the, the, the testing requirement is going to do an awful lot of good in Australia and the other countries that have introduced it um, because they've already got COVID. They're not going to keep COVID out. Um, uh, by testing. Uh, I suppose there's an argument you could say, look, for a limited amount of time, we want to test because the Chinese government hasn't been all that transparent about exactly what's happening in China. And if we test for two or three or four weeks, we get a picture of what's happening in China, at least to some extent. So there is a justification for doing it for a short time, but that's it. I, 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 the, okay, the, what, the what testing talking, regime what should be pulled about as soon the, as possible. What you're talking about is variants and mutations. And yep. so far, the official line from China is that, yes, there's been an enormous amount happening. of COVID, yeah. but it's not happening. There are no yep. variants of concern. In fact, there are variants of concern in the United States, Jack, uh, yeah, particularly around the, mid, around the Midwest. And, um, and, uh, and of course, Australia's not uh, requiring uh, American travellers, even from the Midwest, uh, to, uh, to, to pony up with a negative COVID test before they arrive here. Yeah, but it's not really a, what was never a racial test. It was where you came from. So that if you were, um, uh, and indeed, uh, if you're a Chinese person from the United States or from or, or from somewhere else, you don't get tested when you arrive in Australia. And if you're a white person from China, you get you do get tested. It's not a racial test. It's a test from where you come from. No, I understand, but uh, it does just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I, I understand the argument about variants, possible mutations. Yes, we need yeah. to have a look at this very that, closely. That's only a short term thing. It is but- a short term thing. Um, um, but uh, we've got a very highly vaccinated country, you know, uh, over ninety percent here. Um, our booster rates aren't great, um, but um, uh, if, uh, as China reports, uh, there are no particular variants of concern, um, uh, it just does, so, does seem almost a political decision made by the Australian government. Yeah, perhaps hard to know what their motivation was. As I say, I can see that I can see justification for a short-term uh, testing procedure, but it should really last uh, weeks, not months. And no restrictions at all in Hong Kong in terms of groups gathering, mask wearing, those sorts of things. Uh, the, the mask wearing is still uh, uh, compulsory um, uh, in a lot of places and, and in public and public transport, etc. cetera. Um, that will hang on for a bit, but they're in the process of, as I say, scrambling to catch up with what's happening in China because the Chinese government moves so quickly it, uh, it, it blindsided them. Um, uh, but I suspect most of our uh, restrictions will be, be gone probably by Chinese New Year or shortly thereafter. All right. Now, um, uh, in October of uh, last year, of course, we covered the Brazilian election, um, uh, the runoff, and uh, the original presidential election, I think, was in July. Um, <coughs> and, of course, it's led to January 6th all over again, but this on this time, on this occasion, it was the 9th of January 2023 when Bolsonaro supporters stormed the National Congress, Parliament, Presidential Offices and Brazil's Supreme Court in Brasilia, in the capital of uh, Brazil. Uh, There have been now 1,500 protesters arrested. Uh, No deaths, which is quite a remarkable thing if you saw some of the uh, the carnage wrought by the rioters. Um, And and, uh, now we've got Lula... uh, swearing that basically heads will roll over this, Jack. When does Jair Bolsonaro get back to the country? Uh, he's in, uh, still in Florida, I he's, think. Yes, he um, is. Uh, uh, the, one of the interesting aspects of this, I thought, was that the, the the local authorities in Brasilia, Brasilia is the sort of purpose-built capital in the middle of nowhere, um, uh, the local state authorities and the local authorities in Brasilia are... Uh, Bolsonaro supporters, and there are all sorts of allegations that uh, perhaps one of the reasons why there were no deaths was that there wasn't much policing going on. It may well have been, although there was a well, uh, or a very sort of infamous footage now of a, a sort of mob attacking a policeman on, on horseback, mm. uh, which is distinctly unpleasant. Um, uh, the US, of course, with Bolsonaro still in Florida, uh, the US uh, has been asked or it's become a bit of a media talking point 
as to uh, whether they would extradite or not extradite. That's not the right term, but but uh, but, but basically expel Bolsonaro from the US. And uh, a US State Department spokesman, Ned Price, said, well, he would not comment specifically on Bolsonaro's visa status during a daily press briefing yesterday, uh, citing privacy laws. But Mr. Price said, any person who came to the United States under a diplomatic visa, such as a head of state, and who, and I quote, is no longer engaged in official business on behalf of their government, is expected either to depart the US or request a different type of visa from the Department of Homeland Security within 30 days of the end of their official business. So it's going to uh, it's going to get very messy when he does turn up uh, back in Brazil, won't it, Jack? If he does, yeah. Well, it's another thing. I mean, look, he 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 must be staring down the barrel of it. Have you seen some of Elon Musk's meanderings about this on Twitter, Jack? No, I haven't. He's uh, he did suggest yesterday that he hoped uh, that the Brazilian people uh, would uh, be able to resolve their differences amicably uh, but this was after he's done a fair bit of uh, done a fair bit of uh, done a fair bit of speculating on the result of the election itself back in October and also of course lifted bans on Brazilian uh, um, tw- um, twits I suppose we could call them um, uh, who were uh, who were peddling misinfo. So, you know, he's been talking about uh, releasing, I think he released some stuff about uh, Pfizer uh, and how uh, Twitter under the old management had uh, uh, withheld information, uh, per- perhaps even leaning towards misinformation. Um, so I wonder when he's ever going to lo- release the Brazilian documents, Jack. <laughs> well, I'll have to wait for those. Fair bit to go, I would have thought, before he gets to, gets down to B. It just it, man, look no no deaths quite an extraordinary thing. You got fifteen hundred people locked up. I suggest if the January six uh, stuff is anything to go by, uh, those fifteen hundred be in a fair bit of strife um, and be looking at jail terms. But I mean, how do they resolve it? How do they resolve it and get get going as a country again? Oh, time will fix that. You think? Just yeah, just months, years, weeks. It's not oh, going to be no, quick, well, is it? Weeks, weeks and months. All right. Okay. People, so, will get back, pe- people will get back to work and try to make a quid and feed their family again. Yeah, okay. We'll see. Um, I think there's a lot more in this, uh, and I think there'll be a number of people, um, fairly senior people within Bolsonaro's party, and if not Bolsonaro himself will be charged with fairly, some fairly serious criminal offences. Um, uh, in the United States, Kevin McCarthy, 15th time lucky, Jack. Finally made speaker on the 15th vote, um, and, uh, uh, and that was, uh, I think, uh, Matt Gates, Matt G- Gatesy, the Florida congressman. He'd voted no for Kevin McCarthy 14 times, and one wag on Twitter suggested that uh, once you get past 14, Gatesy wasn't all that interested. Yeah. Um, uh, in, the, in, in the end, he got the numbers. Um, I, I didn't get very excited about this. Um, I just thought this is sort of democracy being a little bit well, messy. Well, it hasn't, hasn't happened for 100 years, Jack. Well, that's all right. But de- de- democracy does get a bit messy from time to time. I don't, I don't mind that at all. Yeah, Gatesy, Gatesy uh, rolled over. There was uh, another congressman had a bit of a whisper in his ear, patted him on the back, and uh, he decided to change his vote. It does speak of a bit of mis- a bit of. Uh, Dysfunction, um, uh, political dysfunction, doesn't it? I mean, what has happened today? I suppose he's he's had a victory on the fifteenth attempt. He's been elected speaker, and now the uh, the, uh, the the House of Reps or the, the Republicans have supported what what is a fifty five page rules package, uh, which lays out their priorities for the remainder of Joe Biden's term and the operating procedures the party will adopt. One of the headline measures is a panel to investigate the weaponisation of government that is expected to zero in on the Justice Department's investigations into former President Trump. Well, it's just not them. You know, I think there's a Georgia grand jury's about to, uh, about to make some announcements there too. But, yes, there's that. Much of the package is kind of normal, what you might expect from a conservative party, but it also allows a single member 
of either party to to uh, to basically bring forward a, a motion of no confidence in McCarthy. Just one. You still got to pass it. But only one, Jack. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and you just feel that this guy is. This guy is basically going to have to be walking on eggshells to, to survive any sort of length of time. Yeah, well, I've had a look at um, um, uh, the proposed rules changes and there's some good and bad in them. There's, there's a couple of really good things. Um, uh, um, at the moment, there is a dysfunction, I think, in, in the Congress in that they're passing uh, trillion dollar, $2 trillion omnibus bills, um, uh, 4,000 pages with 4,000 earmarks, um, and the congressmen get them for a few hours um, and then have to vote on it as a single thing, as a single vote. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's wrong myself. And one of the proposals is that each of the 12 annual appropriation bills that come before the Congress have to be voted on separately. And they're no, no longer going to be allowed to wind all these things into an omnibus bill. And, and that, to me, is a, a very, very healthy change. Well, it, it probably will lead to a government shutdown at some point too. Jack, that's might. one thing that that, uh, that that well, that's not and that's not uh, that's not beneficial to basically anybody, government employees, and anyone receiving any sort of government benefit. I mean, I just I get the idea. You know, I mean, there clearly are some absolute wackos within the GOP. Uh, that that group of twenty led by Lauren Burbot. Um, uh, she's she's one, so she could bring a no confidence motion at any time, and that's and that's basically it would have to go to a vote at that at, at that stage. It would have. Yep. McCarthy. And to me, that to me, that's fine. I'm not concerned what, about that at all. What? Why is that fine? I mean, what? What's well, the What's because, the sense? Because she's of still that? got to win a vote. She's not going to bring votes. That yeah, but she, can't she, win. she doesn't. He doesn't have to have one every day. I mean, technically, that's what can happen. I mean, but basically, there are no limits on bringing a a, a, a a no confidence motion besides one person being disgruntled. If if someone tries to do this every day, they'll change the rules. Simple as that. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it just it just leaves him wide open, and he had to negotiate. McCarthy had to. He's a he's a California uh, congressman, of course, he, a California GOP man. Uh, he had to basically kowtow to to that group. And it speaks of the fact that they don't really have a significant majority. So the 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 what is still a very small section of the party that's that's probably well certainly described as an extreme right wing, extreme right faction of, of the GOP. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, it, it basically that group of twenty can basically you know can can just, just call the rules. I'm not sure that it's a terribly healthy thing where you where you've got uh, a great stonking Congress with 400 plus members and 20 people 20 people within it, not a majority yeah. by a long way, calling the shots. Well, I don't think 20 people are calling the shots. Let's just well, wait and see how how the, how the new rules work out. They certainly did for just the the, the basic thing of McCarthy's electorate. We'll get to. Well, well no, to- no, they, they didn't call the shots. He had to get 217 or 218 votes, and he was 20 votes short of that. And these 20 people were the people who had to help that. Had to, he needed their support to get it through. That's right. Now, Nancy Pelosi, as Speaker, was very good at uh, marshalling the nutcases on the on the Democratic side, the squad, you know, um, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, Ilan Omar, etc. She was very good at keep, keeping those ducks in a row. McCarthy's going to have to get better at this. Fair enough. Now, we did see also the MTG, who was not one of the 20, uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia. Uh, she had the Trumpster on the line on a, on a, on a, on a couple of occasions, and, and Trump did make uh, public statements that the 20 should support McCarthy, Jack, and, uh, and, and was promptly ignored. The new power dynamic is such that Trump doesn't tell figures like uh, Bobert and Marjorie Taylor Greene what to do. They tell him what to do. Oh, MTG, she, no, 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 I don't think you understand MTG very well, mate. She, she, whatever Donald Trump says, she will do. Um, Lauren Burbett was in that camp, but now I think she's become an independent thinker, Jack. Well, who knows? Uh, yeah, time will tell. All right, we're going to get to Russia and Ukraine uh, soon, but there's just a little bit of a problem looming with Sweden's entry to, into NATO um, with... Um, uh, some concern um, 
expressed by the Turks. It's been, this has been going on. It's been bubbling away for a little while uh, that uh, there were a number of members of the uh, Kurdish Workers' Party in Sweden uh, 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 that, uh, that the, the Turks, uh, frankly, think are... Um, are, uh, are terrorists and the Swedes are saying, well, no, we're just going to go through our own sort of rule of law here and, and follow that along. And it may well be a bit of a bumpy ride in terms of Sweden uh, Sweden getting a, a, a becoming a, a member of NATO. Jack, have you been following this at all? I have a little bit. I think, I think it applies to the Finns as well, at least to a smaller extent. The Finns yeah, have less, fewer, yeah. Finns have far fewer of the um, immigrants from uh, from Kurdistan and Turkey, but the, um, uh, the Swedes have plenty of them um, and, uh, frankly, it would surprise me if a good number of them are not members of parties that the Turkish government consider to be um, dangerous. Yes, well, uh, Prime Minister, uh, Swedish Prime Minister Ulf uh, Christensen said, uh, Turkey both confirms that we have done what we said we would do but they also say that they want things that we cannot or do not want to give them. He said um, uh, <clears throat> they applied in May, in May to join NATO, as we know, in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But Turkey objected and accused the country of harbouring militants, including from the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party. Did you know the, the KWP? I don't think those are the right initials, actually. Um, but the Kurdistan Workers' yep. Party is uh, a uh, recognised uh, terrorist organisation in Australia. Uh, I did know that it was as such in Australia, and I'm aware of a fair bit of its history as well, I suppose. Yes, and, and, and it's a sort of dubious one. Certainly there have been uh, uh, the KWP has launched terrorist attacks in, or, well, certainly bombing events with, with, mass, uh, with mass civilian casualties in Turkey, uh, long-standing running disputes there. Um, and it's really as a result of Turkish pressure through NATO that uh, the Kurdistan Workers' Party is a, 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 a terrorist, a banned terrorist organisation in Australia and the US for that matter. Yeah, I, I wonder how closely um, uh, the security services of those countries look into this. I, I know in Australia and in the UK, for instance, um, during the troubles in Sri Lanka, um, we had a lot in Australia and in the UK, both had a lot of uh, Tamil refugees um, and... Uh, there were constant rumours about some of them. Some of them that they were, uh, in fact, still part of the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elan, the LTEE, -E. um, uh, and uh, in the end, not much was done about it. Very few people were ever sent back. Or um, uh, there or, were a couple. There were there were a couple of fundraisers charged with terrorist offence in Australia. Um, uh, along the lines of funding, uh, providing uh, financial support for um, uh, for that particular group, um, and, and uh, uh, my memory is that uh, that they were both convicted and sentenced to long jail terms. Yeah, um, but, but but very little of it. They didn't look very closely or in a very broad sense. They found the worst offenders and and and, and sanctioned them. Well, the Kurdistan Workers Party really is a case of one. One man's terrorist organisation is another man's freedom fighter. There is a little bit of that about it, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> look, uh, while we're talking about Turkey, there was a sort of bizarre report uh, in news.com.au uh, basically uh, on, on the 8th of January, on, on, on the Sunday, and, and suggesting that Turkey is on the brink of civil war. Um, and I look at news.com.au pretty early in my newspaper run and I and I had to stop and think, well, where else is this being reported? And, of course, it was nowhere else. Um, and, and it was really just a, a bit of a thought piece uh, uh, from, um, uh, from a, uh, a Turkey analyst uh, who, who, who's a journalist at, um, at FP, the, the um, uh, foreign, policy, uh, foreign policy newspaper. And... Um, uh, what we do have in, in Turkey is elections this year, Jack, which will be very, very close to watch. We've got 36% of support for Erdogan, which is nowhere near a majority. Um, he's made some very serious errors over the economy. Um, we've talked uh, in previous episodes about just how high the inflation rate is in Turkey, and I think it's running about 80% at the moment, and that's because he refused to allow interest rates to budge. 
Yeah, uh, it looks it looks a bit of a mess. Um, uh, going to be a very interesting election that one. Well, the, the, this this analyst Jack, um, uh, I won't name him, and not that it, not that it's a secret, but this analyst was saying that uh, Erdogan was, it was not beyond Erdogan's reach to um, to create a bit of lo- local turmoil uh, in order in, in order to um, um, you know uh, uh, get people to vote you know for for in, for for him as, as an incumbent. Yeah, it, it's not beyond the bounds of possibilities of that that could happen, or that um, a state of emergency could arise in which he has to um, uh, step in and suspend yeah. the constitution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. State that of emergency, be all possibilities. State of emergency that he might have created himself. Um, uh, I did notice. Look, it was it wasn't uh, uh, it wasn't in recent times. So a couple of years ago, Jack, you, you might have seen the footage. There, there was Erdogan and his and his entourage. Arriving in the Kremlin, and they were made to wait in an ante room, uh, and uh, and very agitated they were too. Bloody big entourage Erdogan gets around with, so there are about twenty people in a fairly small room, and not quite Marx Brothers um, uh, day at the races stuff, but uh, but close enough. And it was the room essentially where 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 uh, Putin's. Um, um, butlers would sit and wait, await their next orders. So they were made to wait there. And uh, then finally Putin emerged and, oh, I'm sorry, no one told me you were here. And <laughs> and the meeting proceeded, but Erdogan was absolutely fuming, you know. And um, and this had a bit of a sequel about July of last year when, um, uh, when there was a meeting in Iran. Putin was there, Erdogan was there, and... Uh, <coughs> And, uh, and Putin was made to wait in front of the media for about 50 seconds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it was a very long 50 seconds, Jack, because he just was looking from side to side. He wasn't taking any questions from the media. Uh, and uh, the 50 seconds elapsed and Erdogan proceeded in the ride. Oh, I didn't realise uh, you were here. No one told me you were here, <laughs> Mr President, and all that sort of stuff. Gave a nice bit of payback there. Oh, they, they must have been reading a Kevin Rudd book. Were you? This was Kevin Rudd's uh, tactic. <laughs> we have wasn't? talked about this. This is a Kevin Rudd tactic. It, it's taken straight out of the Kevin Rudd playbook. Uh, and, and look, what we do know uh, as we move into Russia and Ukraine is there's been uh, an, an incredible amount of oligarch clumsiness, Jack. There's been a number of dead, four dead, in fact. Uh, and in fact, it's led to a number of wags suggesting that if you got hold of a Russian advent calendar and opened up the window, an oligarch could fall out. Hmm. Uh, I did chuckle at that. <laughs> it was quite amusing, wasn't it? I mean, in a very dark way. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Putin did call for a unilateral ceasefire over the Orthodox Christmas, which is uh, in our very early New Year period. And uh, and and just more recently, a, a top Russian uh, top Russian uh, figure has died in a mysterious car crash. I mean. Uh, it, Life expectancies of oligarchs in Russia now, Jack. It's uh, uh, you know they, they seem to be either falling out of windows, shooting themselves. Um, it does speak of a great deal of chaos. Um, how, how closely have you been following the war? There's, you know, the, the, the ceasefire, the unilateral ceasefire, was completely ignored, really, by both sides. Um, yeah, I've been keeping an eye on the on the maps that the French, in particular, release every week or so. Um, there doesn't seem to be much movement. It all seems to be sort of stalemated at the moment. Well, there's 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 a number of things going on, and and uh, look, I look at those maps too. So, so basically, the Ukrainian army has been reluctant to get into sort of pitched battle circumstances. Mm you know, trench warfare, for want of a better term, with the Russians. And they just know it's not their go. They're, they're better off with a stick and move. But there, <coughs> uh, there is fierce fighting uh, in Solodar, which is a village 100 kilometres from Donetsk, 100 kilometres northeast of Donetsk. Uh, fierce fighting there. And uh, uh, the Ukrainians are coming up against probably for the first time in many ways conscripted Russian soldiers who are said to be faring very, very poorly in battle. And few gains, many casualties. Uh, the US State Department puts Russian casualties now at 100,000 plus, which sort of does beg the question about what is, what is a casualty. I mean, how, how many are dead, how many are wounded and cannot return to the, return to the war? Um, 
the the Ukrainians say seventy thousand dead, so we probably would think that was a little bit exaggerated. But n- now Russia is fighting with a conscripted with with a cons- conscripted army, essentially, um, and and of course, well, at least sixty six of them uh, were blown up on New Year's Eve uh, while they were fiddling with their phones and and their uh, military masters hustled them all into one building. Mm. Um, it, I read a report in the New York Times from that cited an unnamed oligarch with close ties to the Kremlin and they said, Putin doesn't know what to do now. He's prepared to sue for peace, but he's going to sue for peace on... Uh, on a basic on the on the grounds that cannot be accepted, so this is just going to go on. I mean, one other thing that I did notice uh, late last year before Christmas and uh, was that uh, um, uh, his uh, his his two IC Medvedev was in was in Beijing um, and uh, meeting. It was when Penny Wong was was in China actually, uh, and and uh, Medvedev was there and meeting. Meeting uh, Chinese officials at, a, at at his level, when uh, all of a sudden President Xi turned up, and it was all smiles and handshakes for the cameras, and then she handed Medvedev a letter, and it was basically, "Take this back to your boss." And yes. one, well, we don't know the contents of it, but one suspects this is this is the context of this is that Putin was saying the Russians are a stoic people, and we can endure a long war. Uh, and I think that I think that was Xi's response again, driven by a need to get the economy rolling. Uh, that we have no interest in any sort of extended war. He, he, he's running out of friends, Putin. Um, uh, the Indians have dropped off him. Uh, pretty much the only place uh, he's welcome now is Belarusia and to an extent Iran. I mean, what's going to happen here in in twenty twenty three, Jack? I mean, <clears throat> we we are seeing a very weakened Putin running around, very weak in Russia, and there must be some sensible heads in the Kremlin, surely, that are saying, how long are we prepared to be an economic pariah for? Because it's not, it's not just 2023 now. What we're looking at is, you know, you, you, you'll be like North Korea for the next 10 years. Mm. Well, we'll have to see whether they're prepared to put their heads up, the sensible people in the Kremlin, or whether they'll fall out of a building if they do. Well, well yeah. Well, that, that, that's what I mean. I mean, this is a it's a it's a unique regime in many ways. That the the Putin's or well, the Kremlin is uh, unlike any other time. I, I can't think of another regime quite like it. Yes, it's a kleptocracy. Yes, it's a totalitarian uh, totalitarian state. But it's also being run by people who are in the intelligence and security business, and I think that's almost almost unique. And I don't know that you know we talk about sort of alternatives to Putin. I, I, if the West and Europe starts thinking about what is going to you know what where the future lies, I think there'd be a certain amount of fear about what's what's going to happen are post Putin. If he does fall off the branch, he'll manage to fall off, fall out of a window himself. Yeah. Well, the China Daily is still talking up, which is the, which is a sort of a mouthpiece of the Chinese Communist Party, is still talking up the um, uh, the China Russia um, uh, uh, alliance, if you like. It's not quite an alliance, but something like it. Um, uh, and and that might be the key, actually. Um, what happens with China? I think it, I think there's a lot to be said about that. Just before cru- cru- uh, um, Christmas again, and 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 obviously after being in receipt um, uh, of uh, of the letter from uh, from President Xi, uh, that uh, that Putin called for closer military ties with China, to a resounding silence from China. Mm. And look, I know we're trying to read the tea leaves on this a little bit. But it just seems like he is running out of friends. Um, I, I, if if I was running NATO, Jack, I would be arming uh, Ukraine to the back teeth as quickly as possible before um, before the Russians can get there can can start manufacturing their cruise missiles again. Um, according to reports, uh, missile parts that that have been found in Ukraine have all been manufactured in twenty twenty two. They're running out. Of the, the 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 serious weapons that they need to basically terrorise 
the Ukrainians in their cities. Uh, and maybe it's time to push them back beyond the borders on the battlefield and then we can start talking about negotiations. Yeah. I don't think they're capable of doing it at the moment. So there you go. The Ukrainians? Yep. Well, um, they, what, what I'm saying is they need the arms. They need the arms. So the Germans are talking about providing them with essentially leopard tanks, um, high, highly mobile tanks. They're saying that's all. I just say I arm them to the back teeth and let's see how we go. If you want to, if you want to see how they're going... Fierce fighting in Solidar, Jack. That's that's really at the that's really at the eastern end of Donbass. So yeah. they are driving deep in there. Well, yeah. we'll see. I, I just, I mean, I, at some point, someone's someone sensible in Russia is going to have to say, how long are we going to be an economic pariah for? Because right now, it's looking at five. They're, they're looking at five to ten years minimum. And Russia's economy went backwards three percent. That's probably a better result than many people expected. But if that's, you know, if that's a trend, three percent becomes six percent, becomes ten percent. You know, they've got real problems. Mm. All right, Iran. Uh, uh, two two more protesters hanged. Uh, in 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 total, that's four. There are there were reports again today as we record this on the. Uh, on the uh, on the tenth of January, that uh, another um, uh, three more people, three more protesters, have been sentenced to death. There are literally hundreds in Iranian prisons. Um, we talked about how the regime was going to respond, and they respond in a rather predictable fashion, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 to, to my observation, I think that the, the, the theocracy is in, in a little bit of feeling a little bit under pressure. I think things aren't going well for them. Well, it is one place where Putin's still still admired. They're still, the Russians are buying their drones. Um, <clears throat> it, it, you would say you would say so. I mean, we're going to it, it, we do talk about this split. Um, between the middle class in Tehran and uh, and those living outside Tehran, who might be uh, uh, who are uh, who are not might be who are more inclined to support the current regime, um, but it, it gets to a point, and we've seen this with the protests in Tehran. You basically you, you can only kill so many people, Jack. Yeah, not only are they scrambling um, uh, to keep control of the clerics, um, uh, they seem to be losing at least some support in the in, in not just in Tehran but elsewhere. Um, it's entirely possible the end could come pretty quickly. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those things, isn't it? You know that that, that when when regimes do when regime change actually occurs organically within a country. It can happen within days. It can happen within within hours, really, can't it? You know, and it really, well, there, there, there's there's a, a sort of a cascade effect that people who had been too cautious to speak out against the regime, once they hear a neighbour or two speaking out against the regime, they all say that they all realise that there's more of them on their side than they thought. Yeah, um, uh, and it happens very quickly. Yeah, yeah. We'll be keeping a very close eye on Iran this year. If there's one regime we'd like to see. Given the flick, it's that one. Um, Jack, I just uh, saw a couple of magazine pieces on various news programs over the break with Sri Lanka. Um, we've talked about it long through 2022, the economic disaster that the country's going through at the moment. Uh, they're currently negotiating with the IMF for uh, debt forgiveness and aid and so forth. Um but there are some real ongoing problems there. Now, 60% of the population are estimated to be malnourished. Uh, and as that's sort of one of those sort of enduring, uh, enduring traumas of this, uh, of this disaster is that parents are having to choose which one of their children will be educated. Sometimes which one gets to school on a particular day and sometimes which one gets educated at all. Yeah, that's right. And that and that's so so that's that's absolutely devastating. So, you know, when we can talk about, you know, economic recovery coming in three or four or five years, but this is the this is the sort of boots on the ground stuff that 
that that can cruel your country and your society going forward for a long time because so you know formal education is is the way you know is the way forward for for all countries you know their their best assets is not whether they got enough tea or or coal or whatever it is it's their people and uh, and their people are basically being under resourced under under trained under skilled there is a hold up with the um, uh, with the debt restructuring. Um, uh, there's a, a whole lot of people from IMF etc. who um, are now saying that some of the debt should, needs to be forgiven because it can't be paid back. Um, and there is the usual yes. argy bargy about who um, who gets to lose. Mm. Um, uh, mm. I noticed that uh, Yanis Varoufakis, the uh, former Greek um, uh, treasurer, and uh, I think he was a lecturer at Sydney University before that. Um, yeah, is sticking his head in there. He's on the committee, um, so we'll see how What's that his view? Out. What's his view? That 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 the debt should be forgiven? Yes, yes. Oh, good on him. I think that's. I mean, it's the only way forward, really. It, but the, the, I think there's probably no argument the debt's going is going to be forgiven. It just depends who gets stuck with the bill. No. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, anyway, it, the, the the lesson for our readers is don't go organic. Yeah, well, yeah, that that that's that's certainly the thing. We we covered that a lot, but I mean, I just really wanted to touch on the fact that you know in, in Sri Lanka, with relatively large families, relatively a, a large group of children in each family, and this is not necessarily a, a decision that's made according to gender, um, which it might be in other parts of the developing world, but. Sri Lankans are saying uh, are having to make these tough choices now that perhaps one of their four children will receive an education and the other three won't. The other thing for our for our listeners is as soon as they get the money back from the IMF and they get the thing up and running with fuel, reliable fuel, etc., if you're looking for somewhere to go for a beach holiday in Southeast Asia, fly to oh, Colombo. I, I, look, I reckon, I reckon we might have to give it a lash this year, Jack. You know, I mean, mm. even... Uh, even for a couple of weeks. I mean, it's a, it's a country that I wanted to visit for a long time, and yeah, so, you know, it's 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 not a, it wouldn't be a charity visit. It's a beautiful, beautiful country, obviously, and uh, this is just it's just heartbreaking because once you realise where you could have had four children educated in your family and you're only going to get one, you, the mm. economic and social consequences of that run for generations. Yep. All right. Okay. Well, we're now going to move on to our. I'm going to go all the way back to Australia and the voice, the uh, wide brown land. The wide brown land. Uh, it's uh, a bit, bit, bit greener and a little bit wetter uh, up in the northwest than than normal. We'll get to that in a little while too. But um, the voice is starting to pick up uh, 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 in terms of coverage in our media. Uh, uh, Peter Dutton. Uh, released a letter to the media addressed to the Prime Minister, but apparently the Prime Minister didn't ever see it. Um, and, uh, and and in that, uh, uh, Dutton raised, I think, 11 points, 11 questions that he wanted the Prime Minister to answer on the na- the nature of the voice. And, and much of it goes to the structure of the advisory bodies, uh, whether they be local, state or federal, of those advisory bodies advising advising our parliaments on Indigenous matters. Was it valid, Jack, or was he just playing games? Oh, I read the letter and thought maybe he's a, he's a listener to the Two Jacks podcast <laughs> um, because, because, because we raised a few of these issues the last time we spoke. Yeah, but since then, Jack, I've, had a bit of, I've done a bit of reading over the Christmas, and they are there. Uh, the, these things are there. The detail is there. Um, there was a, some very fine reporting in the Australian about that today, and I'd uh, ask our listeners to to have a look at that. Um, it, it it may well be that there is that it, it it's too much information for a brochure. I'll put it that way. Um, and, and 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 maybe there's being a bit of sol- it's not as if the information's not there. Is what I'm saying. Um, and and whether it's contentious or not, it's not it's not the point I'm trying to make here. I'm I'm saying that Dutton, um, for for you know reasonable for, for for he seems to have his heart in the right place at the moment. I know he's not he's not he hasn't made a knee jerk response like the National Party has. Um, 
uh, and but the sorts of things that he had ha- had asked are all available now, are all available anywhere. But I think the point, perhaps that he was, perhaps he was trying to make, is that it's not widely known. It's not being widely promoted to the public at this stage. Um, I, I think if the public read the details in, say, the Langton Karma report, this referendum will fail. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that, but yeah, that that that's it. And I've seen some, um, I've seen some um, 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 uh, fairly fairly sort of um, um, uh, grey views on all of that. But how do you get across? How do you get across in a in a, in a rather simple, straightforward way what's being designed here? Well, they haven't you, told us what's you, been you designed. Can't, even you, even you, at a very basic level, we don't even know where in the Constitution this is going to go. And when the Constitution set up with a series of chapters, a chapter for the Parliament, a chapter for the Executive, a chapter for the Judiciary, and a couple of other ones that don't, they're not really relevant to our purposes here, we don't even know where this is going to go. So there is no... there is insufficient detail in my view. I mean, the government seems... This is, this is a tactic. The government seems prepared to say... Well, we'll rely on the goodwill of the public um, uh, to pass this, and the public has goodwill towards a, a recognition for Indigenous people in the Constitution. But we won't give them clear, concise, transparent details, and we'll ha- and we just hope there'll be no groundswell of, of of demand for that. And they might be right about that, but it's a risky it's a risky way to go about it, in my view. Well, when we talk about the establishment of a voice, that is a that is a body that will be elected, not selected. This is what we talked about in our last program. But, so, that, but that isn't clear in in the Karma Langton report, for instance. Well, on further it, reading, it, it, it is ambiguous as to whether it's going to be elected or selected. In fact, they they talk about selection of some people. They're going to leave that to the regions. They say. Yeah, so, I mean, but there, there are local bodies. There are there are local bodies. There are state bodies. There are there are federal bodies. But we are talking now about a proper definition about Aboriginality. Um, <clears throat> that's that's been that's been in more additional material that's come forward. Um, <laughs> I just think that this is becoming incredibly complicated, Jack, uh, and <clears throat> complexity uh, complexity in in, in uh, in referenda, it, it can be absolutely disastrous. Absolutely. Um, but so how do you do it? How do you how, how do you do it without without falling into platitude? Then, then then you have to work out first of all what it's actually going to. If you're going to change the constitution, you need to work out what do you want. What difference do you want to make to the Constitution? Where does it go in the Constitution? What does it say? It needs to be simple, straightforward and transparent. And then you have to say, and this is how we're going to put it into place. And they haven't done that. It needs a hell of a lot more work before it gets anywhere near a vote. Well, they they are talking about referendum in August. Yeah, well, they're going to have to... to, um, uh, Head down, bum up. We're going to have to work pretty hard to get enough of that out before. It's the then. big thing this year, isn't it? I mean, look, there'll be there'll be be rolling issues uh, that will confront the Albanese government um, yep. throughout the year. Of course, there'll be crises, there'll be scandals. I mean, it's just the nature of politics. But this is their big agenda item for the year. Certainly, if they're going to run a referendum at the, in the latter part of it. Um. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I'm concerned that they that their communications are poor. That's, that I guess, we sort of agree on that. But I'm saying that it, 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 in order to dumb, well, we, I guess I'm really, really struggling with that term. But they really need to dumb a lot of stuff down for people because in order to talk about advisory bodies. Uh, that are beholden to the parliament. I notice that they've been starting to talk about this a little bit more now. Advisory bodies that are beholden to the parliament. Um, the, the the referendum will will simply be will be a simple question on on constitutional recognition, yes or no. That's that's what's being anticipated at the moment. With the rest of it being with the rest of it, the detail being done in the parliament. Now, do you have a problem with that? Um, I don't. I don't think if it's left to that, it will pass. I, I, w- I would want it to pass, but I don't think it will. 
it, it can easily be knocked off. The difficulty for someone like Dutton, who is trying to, I think he's trying to walk a line here. He's got he's got his own his own constituency to be concerned about, um, and and so far. So far, he hasn't sort of bowed to the you know the the, the darker angels there, so to speak. Um, uh, and, and I think there is kind of goodwill across the parliament, with the exception of the National Party, of course. Uh, but there are members within the National Party who uh, have condemned the uh, have condemned that stance. Terrific article in the Australian today uh, from. Um, uh, well, the, the one I would sort of draw people's attention to is that there's a report uh, from <coughs> from Tom Cunt, well, by Rosie Lewis and Paul Garvey about voice member criteria is a non-issue according to Tom Karma, and and a terrific op op-ed piece um, uh, by Ben Wyatt, uh, which is time for us to vote for legislation on a voice on a on a, on, on a voice, I should say. Um, um, I look, I, 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 you know, um, where he, he basically goes where a few other people haven't gone, and that's to basically have a good crack uh, at, uh, at uh, the opponents of the voice, including Warren Mundine. Because Warren Mundine, Jack, as Ben White's piece will make absolutely abundantly clear, he was the voice. Yes, when he yes, was appointed, I, I when he was appointed by Tony Abbott for a voice, but at the moment, I don't think it's much chance of succeeding. And to me, that would be a shame if it doesn't succeed. But that's the way I think the government's heading. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I, I, I don't know that we need to be uh, uh, asking uh, the people of Australia a complicated, uh, dot pointed. Um, uh, <coughs> a question or a series of questions in a referendum. Uh, basically, I think it's got to come down, do you support constitutional recognition of the Aboriginal people? Because it doesn't, basically doesn't exist in the Constitution. And then you can go with that uh, to the parliaments to create the bodies outside, to create the voice, to create the, the, the parliamentary advisory bodies. And then you can go through the Mia Carter process as well. Yeah, I, I think you were, more, I th I think you were right more. last time. What did you say? Uh, the proposal needs to be clear, concise and coherent. We can't vote on things in the nebula and find out later what's in them. We need to know the makeup of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, the body, uh, extra parliamentary body. And we need a form. We need a clear form of words. None of those things we have. I think you were absolutely right last time. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, I'm starting to think now that. Uh, that what we don't, what we want to avoid, I think complexity is the problem here. And and if we if we go into minutia, if we go in, if we go into the weeds on this, I think that would be the disaster. But but this is not but, minutia. This is just the basics. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. You're right about that. We do need to we do need to say this is what's going to happen. This with yeah. with the support of the people is what's going to happen. And yeah. this is how and, it's going and, to happen. And a really simple thing is we need to know where in the constitution it's going to go. That, that might seem unimportant, but you know, one, one of the few subjects I got honours in in, uh, in my law degree was constitutional law. It's quite important. Yeah, I, I, I well imagine it is. We're not talking about a preamble anymore, are we? I mean, these no. were, these were the uh, these were the sort of um, so furrowed brows of, of Australian politics for the last twenty years. Was, was so, so if I was preamble. marking the government report card on the, on the voice, I'd say needs a lot more work. Needs a lot more work. Well, okay, they've got all year this year. I think August is far too early, by the way, too. I just think that's and and they've just they've thrown it out there over the Christmas period. You know, and, it and, could, and, it and could be as early as August. And I don't think voting in the cold and wet of August for most of Australia is a good plan. And people 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 always vote um, uh, the way you don't want them to with cold and wet yeah. of August. Have, have the have the, have the well the September's no good because the footy on footy finals are on so you, we're yeah, going to have yeah. to do have, it. have it in, have it in October or November. October yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, October and maybe November all right um, uh, where were we next Jack um, yeah, you're, you're going to tell me about the floods in WA well, I've only seen a little bit of uh, television footage of this I haven't seen much about it at all some of the satellite stuff is just unbelievable I mean the, the amount of water there. Uh, with the sort of Fitzroy Valley, um, Fitzroy River bursting its fangs, that some of the satellite stuff is just incredible. The uh, the town, I don't think it's a city, 
uh, of Derby, and I believe that's the correct pronunciation, Jack, although if, a West if, if you're from Western Australia, that is correct. Yeah, uh, is, is basically cut off. Um, and, uh, yes, and we saw basically over the Christmas period um, with uh, the, the Murray just surging uh, into, into South Australia. Um, and, and this is, you know, we've had all of this rain um, north of, well, north of, well, well, north of South Australia, of course, uh, and then it just takes that long to flush through the river system. Um, this is what's happening in, w- this is essentially what's happening in WA. The satellite photo, photographs are just extraordinary and what is a fairly dry part of the country is almost almost under a couple of metres of water at the moment, you know, large chunks of it, thousands and thousands of square kilometres. It's a one in a hundred year event, Jack. We had about five of them last year. Mm. Uh, and I did see uh, my uh, my buddy there, Graham Lloyd, the environment editor, uh, explained uh, that uh, one in a hundred year events it just means that it's a hundred to one shot that it'll occur in any given year, which I guess is about right, if, if I understand odds, and I I think I do, um, but uh, yeah. Look, uh, we uh, we sy- we certainly sympathise with uh, with the people of uh, Northwestern Australia, and they are absolutely getting hammered in, in uh, very very uh, very very difficult conditions at the moment. Um, uh, and the, what's the what's the old joke? Water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. Well, yeah, you wouldn't want to drink that. Well, if you, the, 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 in Mildura, they had what's called black. Black water, Jack. You wouldn't want to drink any of that. Um, that was that was flushing through the system. Uh, no, it'd be the Victor Bravo only, even for cleaning your teeth. Mate. <laughs> if you live in Milchur, you'd you'd want to be on something stronger. All right, now, of course, obsessing us over the um, over the Christmas period and beyond was sport, and one in particular, Test cricket, Jack. Uh, I don't think it's been a wonderful summer for Test cricket, has it, in Australia? No, no. Um, uh, the, the series in Pakistan between Pakistan and New Zealand was much, much more entertaining. Yeah, really good, really good attempts from both sides to come up with results, although I did see the Pakistanis gave, uh, gave was it New Zealand, about 15 overs to make 130-odd? Yeah, it was a, it was a, a Sir Humphrey brave uh, declaration. You know, How are you going to um, knock a side over in 15 overs? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, with with the possible exception of uh, the Sydney Thunder uh, in a T Twenty game, how are you going to knock a side over in fifteen overs in a Test match? Yeah, like, I, but, but the the last day of the final Test was an absolute ripper. Um, the momentum uh, waxed and waned. Yeah, uh, you know the, the the Pakistanis were on top, the Kiwis were on top, and it came down to I think there were three overs left to play. Uh, Pakistan needed 15, um, and the umpires had already decided that that, that um, uh, only the slow bowlers could bowl. So that meant that Pakistan couldn't win because if they, if they hit 10 off and over, um, uh, the, the Kiwi captain could put on the fast bowler and that would be it. Yeah. Um, but the Kiwis were still a chance. It was nine down, and they had a really good shout with three overs to go. Um, it, they lost on the review. And the umpires had another little chat, and that was it. It was all over. But it was a cracking finish to a test match. Well, we'll get to bad light and test cricket in a little while. Um, oh, look, the question, I think, rather than a statement at the end of this test series, and it's a pretty early pretty early uh, um, part of the uh, time of the year to be finishing our test cricket uh, in Australia. You know, here we are. Well, it was all done and dusted on the 7th of January. I, the, the, rather than a statement of, of how good Australia is, I think it, 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 it's more a question: Is Australia? How, it, 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 yes, Australia may well be good, but where is Test cricket around the world? And um, you've mentioned Pakistan and New Zealand; uh, uh, they go pretty well. Uh, England, of course; India, of course; um, uh, and beyond that, there's not much to trouble the scorers. That's correct. Um, I think the one day, one day international uh, format be, be, pretty I'm... pretty much dead. Um, uh, uh, the uh, I was in the pub last night and it was on the first of the New Zealand Pakistan games. And uh, apart from the fact that there were two Kiwis there uh, firmly watching it, everybody else wanted to switch to the Big Bash look. Um, uh, well, look, and- uh, there's a big concern. This is what I'm talking about: future Test cricket. Now, for, if for whatever reason India decide 
they're not they're, they're going to uh, you know pump up the IPL and play a lot of T20s and ODIs and all that sort of stuff and don't get serious about their uh, about their test side. That's not the case, by the way. But if that happened, I you know the the the, the future of test cricket around the world would be very very limited and and it would be, just be Australia, basically Australia v New, v New Zealand, Australia v, v England. Yeah, that's that's not going to happen because they seem to love Test cricket as well. I think the ODIs will, will finish up, and I think that will create a little bit more space in the in the schedule for Test cricket. Um, Australia's um, got a big year of Test cricket ahead of us. Um, uh, um, go to uh, India, where India are very very hard to beat at home, uh, and then we go to England for an Ashes series. Um, and the England team. No, no, um, hang on just were, a minute. So, so basically, you, you've got. You've got the Test World Championship in June. That that yep. that that will go before the before the Ashes series. That will yes. almost certainly be Australia v India. Australia yep. is currently on top by a mile, and you know much will be determined uh, whether India can finish on top or second. It, it won't matter much uh, uh, depending on the series, which starts at Nagpur. Um, in, it's on mathematically night. possible that a couple of other countries could get in there, but that's not going to happen. No, you would think it's Australia v India. So that's that's. So I'll just run through. I'll run through it. So we've got the we've got uh, the, the the first test in in Nagpur uh, on February nine. Uh, yep. Then, uh, then, basically, Australia uh, will play in the Test World Championship at Lords in June uh, <coughs> against India. Then, after that, uh, there's the five Tests uh, for the Ashes, starting June 16 and ending the the, uh, the last day scheduled play uh, on uh, on the. Um, Fifth test is August one. There's a three day break scheduled between test two and three, and test four and five, and the other breaks are just a week. It's a really tumultuous period of test. When they're done that, then it's over to India in October, November for the ODI World Cup, which will be a major television event. I know. Look, you do get the sense that a lot of players. Um, uh, the players themselves are driving the change on ODIs. That they're they're looking a bit disinterested. Yeah, I think that the World Cup will be the the farewell tour for the uh, for the One Day International. Oh, I don't cricket. know. Yeah, I don't know. That this, is, any... this is a chance for greatness for Australia in Test cricket this year. India Absolutely. are hard to beat at home. Yeah. Um, winning the, I don't think winning the World Test Championship matters much. But then an Ashes series against an England side oh, that have gone from one win in seventeen to nine wins in ten. They're very very good. Well, let me tell you, there's two, there's two forms of test cricket being played around the world at any given time, right? So so a left-handed, when you look at the Australian setup, we four of the top seven bats in the Australian side are left-handers. They, they, they bat left-handed because this is the influence of the DRS. Left-handers make up 15% of the population, but they make up more than half of the Australian top order. Um, that's because... Because most predominantly most of the bowling they face will be right arm over the wicket, and most of and those left handers do have an advantage over right handers. Where the where any ball that's going on and hit the stumps, hit them in front of the stumps is generally speaking going to pitch outside the line of leg, a line of the leg stump. A lot of those things used to be given out, but now with the DRS they're not. So that provides an absolute distinct advantage for left handed batsmen in Australia, in South Africa, in New Zealand, and in England. But you take those four to India and they're facing they're facing off break bowling on wearing wickets. And that's where that that that, that advantage that left handers have just disappears. It becomes mm. a disadvantage. And that's why everyone goes, oh why 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 can't we win in India? That's one of the real reasons for it. You know, you you're facing facing Ashwin and and uh, and others uh, who are bowling, you know, huge breaking deliveries in wearing wickets, and you're a left-hander. You're going to be knocking the ball in the slips or the bat pad or the keeper. Um, the other reason it's hard to win India. India are good. <laughs> well, they're a very good batting side, but that's that. Yeah. That's, you you actually got two two levels of Test cricket being played at any given time. One advantages in our home grounds and other similar other similar Test playing countries advantages left-handed bats. But when you take those left-handed bats, they're all good players, by the way. We're talking about Usman Khawaja, Dave Warner, um, uh, uh, 
Travis Head and uh, and a very good keeper who got his hundred uh, in Melbourne. Um, uh, they going they are going to struggle. Just just you know the, the weight of um, the weight of advantage just disappears. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's a chance for greatness for the Australian team this year, um, but it's also a chance to not be so great if they don't get it right. Uh, I think they're a very good side. I mean, it's just hard to know. Their bowling is spectacularly good with lots of depth, um, and and it, and it's created all sorts of you know good problems to have for selectors. I think their bowling is very very good. There's actually talk getting down to the batters that Peter Hanscom might be uh, might be going to India. Might be selected there, the Victorian skipper. Um, good, as a backup keeper as well. Um, good player of spin. Uh, but <laughs> make no mistake, this Indian side, this England side is much, much better. I think they're the first team to win 3-0 three, three in um, in Pakistan ever. Yeah, they're good. They're good. There's um, no doubt about that. Uh, they're... they're uh, uh, well, they're, they're not, not. Stokes is a brilliant captain. They've got a fantastic coach. Um, uh, they've got the, the the tried and true uh, swing bowlers that that are perfectly suited for English conditions. Their batting would be a concern uh, if Joe Root if Joe Root sort of slips out of form or, or they're able to knock over Joe Root fairly easily. That would be the problem. Um, uh, you know, making making huge runs quickly in Pakistan is not really a great test. Uh, Scott Bolton, uh, will he go to India? We're not quite sure. Agar almost certainly will because they want a left-arm uh, orthodox tweaker. Uh, will Swepson go? Uh, much of it will depend on the fitness of uh, Cameron Green uh, because if Cameron Green's playing, well, you've already got that third quick. Uh, and Stark, of course, will miss the first and maybe second tests in India uh, with his finger injury. Going to be a fantastic year of Test cricket, but we're going to know a lot more about the future of the game by the end of the year. And we'll know a lot more about who's who's who in the zoo and who's the best at it, but we'll also know a lot more about the future of the game as we go through. Um, BBL, Jack, do you get on any of that in Hong Kong? Uh, yep, it uh, uh, generally comes on um, uh, right about cocktail hour a couple of nights a week, you know. Yeah, well, what are you talking about? Uh, oh, yeah, about four o'clock, yeah, yeah. Um, most of the games on there. The ratings have been very good and the attendances have been pretty good. Um, and uh, the Scorchers, again, who have been the dominant side in the competition, uh, are certainly on top of the ladder. Um, uh, Sydney Sixers seem to be a very good side too. Um uh, and they, don't, you know, it seems to be those two. I hope I'm not doing anyone a disservice there. Uh, the Melbourne Stars, uh, since Warney, Warney left, they uh, they can't uh, they can't blow out a candle at the moment. They're terrible. Um, but we did see, in fact, uh, Adam Zampa, who's the captain of the side. Uh, you would have seen the man cat, the failed man cat. I, did, I didn't see that, and I hadn't been able to find it um, uh, 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 on replay anyway. Yeah, all right. Well, I, it was something that um, uh, <coughs> grated with me a little bit. I was given out man catted um, by a bowler who went past the vertical and I tried to explain that to the umpire and he just didn't know the rule. Um, and so I had to get, I had to leave the field. Um, uh, but uh, obviously Adam Zampa didn't realise the rules either so he's gone past. He's gone past the vertical. He's actually gone to bowl, and the and, mm. and I forget who the player who the the, uh, the batsman was. Um, he had basically not even left his crease by the time Zampa was gearing up to release the ball. Uh, and as he's gone to release it, obviously the the batsman's wandered out of his crease there towards the towards the striker's end. And uh, and Zampa just turned around and whipped the bars off. By that stage, the, the so it's kind of like a. You know, it's kind of like mozzing. You know, you you can't really do that. You've got to basically see the the uh, the batsman leave his crease before the ball. The the, the definition is of at the bowler's vertical at the bowler's vertical point. Um, and um, and he didn't do that. But um, mancads, I think we've got to stop calling them mancads, don't we? We just call them runouts. Mm. When it's done properly, I mean, clearly the batsman's trying to take advantage. I don't think that was the case with the Renegades. And when Adam Zampa was interviewed about it afterwards, he goes, oh, 
it didn't really matter much, so I did it. And you go, well, if it didn't matter much, don't do it. Um, uh, certainly there was a, a few incidents in the test series against South Africa. A couple of times I think um, Mitchell Stark, yeah, Stark uh, a turned around well. and gave a warning. Um, and uh, to be fair, I think the, the, um, uh, the South African batsmen were taking the mickey a bit. Oh, there's, there's definitely advantage being sought. Um, uh, I don't know if you saw some of the T20 World Cup stuff, and I'm thinking of a New Zealand uh, batter who um, who was basically um, um, down in a down in a sprinter's position with his bat behind the crease, down in a sprinter's position, which is probably the way it should be done, you know, in a T20 environment at least. Um, and he was basically getting down, and he was watching also. He wasn't seeking that advantage. But, yeah, it is something that's creeping into cricket and where batsmen are wandering out of their creases before the ball is bowled, before the bowler gets past the vertical, then I think uh, it's just we just call it run-outs, don't we? That's what we should well, do. It, it would be simpler if you got if you got rid of the rule that um, that what didn't apply to, in your case the um, the vertical rule and just said um, at, you, you're free to run them out whenever you like um, uh, until the ball's bowled. Well, that's the thing. That's why you can't have that because otherwise you would you could technically have and there are some unpleasant people in cricket who would actually mm. go up and you'd sort of it'd be like taking a penalty kick where the where the bloke came up and. And and uh, to to take to put the ball in the net and went one way and then went another and then stopped and then went another way and then you know and you just can't be done that way so so you really just need to stick with that batsmen need to stay behind the popping crease and bowlers bowlers need to uh, uh, bowlers need to I guess respect them and yeah look I, I thought Stark handled that particularly well because that was a warning stay behind the crease mate I've got to you know, and that's what he said. Hmm. So I think I think uh, we we could be less controversial about all of this now. It's a batsman seeking advantage, and um, and uh, and and in sort of certainly in short form cricket, uh, it can be very very important on the result. Uh, prior to prior to Christmas, Jack, uh, with uh, the football and uh, the uh, the A League, uh, we called for Melbourne Victory to be punted from the competition. Um, but I think we did. We did. It was a controversial view. I still, I, st- I can't believe they've been given. Well, we'll go through what they've been fined. It's just been released today. Uh, Mel- Melbourne Victory has been fined five hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and fans will be banned from sitting in certain areas at home games after further ha- sanctions were handed down by Football Australia. Following one of the but, darkest days, the problem days. comes from the from the north end or the MCG end of that of that ground, I believe. I, I, I don't buy any of that. <laughs> I don't buy any of that. I mean, you might find a few mugs there getting together, you know, sort of doing doing one another up. But if you put them down the other end, is they going to? Who's to say they're going to behave? One of the reasons why I think um, the crowds in uh, at AFL crowds are, are fairly well behaved is that you don't have uh, all your fans at one end, that you have um, uh, you, you, a mixed crowd all around the ground. There's more separation now. There certainly is more separation now in AFL. I would argue, Jack, that there's probably a bit more going on on the ground um, when uh, the, in an AFL game than it might be in a football game, in a uh, in a soccer game. That, um, that and the fact that um, the, the crowds of the AFL um, are, are not just a bunch of buffy blokes anymore. Yeah, but it's still tribal. I mean, there's, there's ticking a lot of boxes for, for violence that really just doesn't occur. I mean, now, we can't say that there's none because there is, you know, you know, a, a few bit of biff goes on in the crowd and so forth, but, but, but there hasn't. You know, but besides when uh, when um, uh, when Buddy kicked his thousands goal, we we don't have we don't have pitch invasions. That's the big that's the big issue. There is an argument that soccer itself leads to a certain amount of drama that that and, and emotion attached to it because it's a game of you know limited scoring. And mm. and uh, and that people can get all pent up over that sort of stuff. Um, we know that there are, I think, three people have been charged with uh, fairly serious criminal offences. 
Um, and presumably they'll never be allowed to uh, darken a, uh, a, a Football Australia uh, match ever again. $550,000. Is that enough? Well, I think we were right last time. I yeah, think, um, that's what I thought. This sort of offence, uh, and, and because they're repeat offenders, you, um, you say, you know, give us back the franchise. And it, and, it sends, and it sends a message to it, to Sydney FC, to Sydney Sydney Wanderers, any 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 side that really had uh, any club that fails to basically deal with some of its worst supporters. This is what will happen to you. Yep. Yeah, I thought a bit weak. A bit weak. Um all right, uh, now look, I uh, I'm going to hand over uh, uh, the microphone now to uh, to Hong Kong Jack because he is our royal, <laughs> as our royal reporter, uh, and uh, I have studiously avoided all this stuff, Jack. What oh, is going on? Could. I can't. This has been the most entertaining thing that's happened for a long, long time. Well, what's going on? I mean, he's being interviewed. He was interviewed. Was it on CNN or what was going on there? I don't know. I mean, I was just catching grabs on social media. He's got a book out, which isn't out yet, but everyone seems to have read it. Um, He killed 25 people in Afghanistan, or so he says, and he seems to be troubled by that, and that's probably not a good idea to publicise it in in that case. I'm just sick and tired of very wealthy, very privileged people complaining. Yeah, they're the most the terribleness of their existence. They're, they're the most self-absorbed couple since John Lennon and Yoko Ono, um, uh, uh, wallowing in self, privileged self-pity. He's given the stepmother uh, a bit of a slap too, hasn't he? He did, he did. And they are like John and Yoko. You remember the ballad of John and Yoko where um, uh, John was uh, carrying on that um, the press were going to crucify him? He was uh, singing a song about his imminent crucifixion. Yeah, well, well, Harry hasn't gotten quite that mad just yet, um, but not far from it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it's been a lot of look. It's caused me a lot of harmless, harmless amusement. I think. Uh, so, are you going to buy the book Spare? It's thirty five bucks. No, 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 because it's all. It's no, all come on, Jack. You've got to do it for our listeners. I guarantee you, none of our oh, listeners okay. are going to buy the bloody thing. You've got to yeah, well, at okay. least well, buy I'll, it online. I'll, I'll, I will read it so you don't have to. <laughs> I, um, I uh, believe you can get it. I noticed the, the Daily Telegraph with just a pinch of mischief was saying you could buy it for fifty uh, percent off just about anywhere. You know, it was on. Uh, it was almost like it was being reminded. Um, uh, thirty-five bucks at the moment, Jack. But you might be able to pick it up online and and give us a book report next week. Yeah, well, uh, one of my, uh, I got a, a text from an English mate, and he was talking about uh, Harry had always had a lot of support from the veterans community, the military veterans community, because of his excellent work with the Invictus Games and his own ten-year service in the army. Um, uh, but as this mate says. You're going to be losing a lot of that support. But firstly, because he he he, he was talking about how many um, uh, people he'd killed in the war, and that's just not a done thing. Um, uh, and, and Basil secondly, Foley said it. Basil Foley said it on Foley Towers. I was in the Korean War. No, he said I was in the war. He didn't say Korean because his wife came and corrected him. I was in the war, you know. I killed three people when he was angry yeah. at a guest or something. I can't remember the context of it. Yeah. It is a very and, uh, strange thing to do. And, and But, the, but the, the biggest thing that's going to uh, upset his, his friends in the military community was that uh, it's bad enough that his far, fairly squishy brother sat him on his ass. Yeah. Um, but then Harry um, uh, wrote a book about it and, and told everybody about that. Uh, rather than just keeping storm about it, and then complained about how he had a broken necklace and he had to ring his therapist straight away, and that's just embarrassing. It is a little bit, isn't it? I mean, what's what's? I mean, oh, he's also. I did read something today. I've been sort of studiously avoiding it, but I did read something today. He calls he calls Charles Pa, which is uh, which is delightful. Um, but uh, but Pa has to do a lot of. Uh, semi-naked handstands apparently because of his polo injuries. He, he, he wasn't in the war, of course. He didn't kill 25 people. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, there were times, well, uh, yeah, there were times when um, when they called the boys in, you know, because Diana had gone and Camilla was on the scene and they wanted to see how, how they'd get on with Camilla and... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it just sounds like a really terrible soap opera to me. Uh, 
It, it's the greatest literary act of self harm that I can recall. Uh, what, the book's uh, not even out yet, Jack. Yeah, yeah, no, but it's a, it's an absolute shocker. There's kind of no way back for him after this, um, uh, because he's absolutely trashed his reputation in the UK. Uh, the, he, he and Megan are, 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 are the second and third least popular royals. Prince Andrew still holds the candle on that one, but um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but they are the next two up 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 on the table. So you know. Well, um, I got there's... some I got some bad news for 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 royal watchers like yourself, Jack. The the terms of settlement with uh, Virginia Giffa. Yeah, uh, uh, was basically a year of silence, and and that comes to an end in March. Yep, she can say what she like. Um, it, it's it's hard to imagine she can do any more damage to Prince Andrew's <laughs> reputation, but um, oh. uh, uh, but I suppose it's possible. Well, look, you know, he's, he's he's really just a phone call away from another BBC interview. Uh, yeah. To repudiate it all, and which you know, as I described, in well, one of my well that, that'll help, won't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, was, it, it wasn't just a train wreck; it was a it was a train wreck that went on to <laughs> went on to smash up an orphanage before coming to rest on a box of kittens. It was just an absolute disaster. They, these are these are terrible people. I mean, I, I just think they're terrible people. When why are we saying, oh, they 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 should be they should be a constitutional figureheads. These are terrible people. Yeah, and the amazing thing is Harry has made his brother and his father look pretty good. <laughs> although, although Edward VIII, he's, he's still the poster boy for lunatic mm. lunatic royals. Um, oh, yeah, look, uh, well, all right, so we'll get the book report next week. You can just buy the e-book, mate. Probably only cost you four or five bucks. You might have be able to, you know, a yeah, little yeah. bit of uh, dodgy intellectual property stuff. Uh, might have be able to pick it up cheaper. Um, so we expect the book report there and um, – <laughs> God only knows. It looks to be about three or four hundred pages. It, it, that'll be a slog. That, that you'll need. Did, did you'll I, need. You'll send, need copious I, amounts of alcohol to get you through that. Did I send you through? I like a meme, as you know. Um, did I send you through the meme? There was a, a wonderful thing in the Netflix um, uh, video that they did, where it purports to be they're sitting in the lounge room at home at, at Montecito. And uh, after this is after the Oprah Winfrey interview, oh, yeah. and the tech and the text arrives from from his brother Prince William, and he shows this to to Megan, and then there's all sorts of tears and upset, uh, and the meme uh, writers have got a hold of it, and the um, uh, he's holding the phone out um, uh, and showing her, uh, and says to her, "Shit, I do look like him," and uh, and her <laughs> yes, response sure. is. Okay, you do look like him, but we'll never agree to a DNA test just in case. And then the final scene is of her with her head in the hands, and she says, "Oh my God, I'm Mrs. Who? I'm Mrs. Hewitt." Yeah, well, he did. Look, I, 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 not saying like I've read more of this book than I than I actually have, but apparently he deals with this sort of stuff. That he looked that 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 that, that and it was a bit of a family joke. And Charles used to. Well, sort his of, father thought it was funny. Yeah, his father. Yeah, well, well we're both we're both royal watchers. It's, it, it's just, this is what I hate about it. It drags us into this stuff. I have sort of studiously avoided doing it. I did read, to be fair, one article this morning only because I knew we'd be talking about it. Uh, well, I, I, I will read it so you won't have to. All right, it's, been, it's a bit like well, Mike Carton's tweets. Yeah. I'll read them because you, <laughs> you're not allowed to. We, <laughs> that's right. We have. We have, in fact. Uh, we're going to wrap up unless you've got something. Oh, else. Just, just, just before. No, no, just, just before, before we go. George Anthony Devolder Santos, Jack. Have you seen this, mate? Yeah. George yeah, Anthony well, uh, Devolder Santos, if that is his real name. I mean, he could pull and pull the mask off at any given time and be completely someone else. Is this it, was the, the best thing I, I saw on the whole speaker in Broglio was a tweet on January 6th before it was resolved. Yeah. It's, it, it says this, it's time for Congress to come together and make George Santos Speaker of the House. After all, he already served two terms as president, was a hero <laughs> in the Crimean War, won a Pulitzer Prize and a Nobel, is a qualified neurosurgeon and won silver in downhill skiing at Innsbruck in 1960. I saw a couple of yeah, There was another one, too, that I fought alongside him. I fought alongside him at, uh, at Nomaha Beach, you know. Um, uh, yes, he's just complete fantasist. And now under investigation, uh, the New York uh, Third Congressional 
district representative now under investigation from too many bodies to name right here and now, including yeah. most of all that that one of his campaign managers, well, his campaign manager was ringing up people pretending he was Kevin McCarthy. There's nothing wrong with having a fabulous in uh, uh, in 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 the Congress. We've got plenty of them. There's a senator from Connecticut who claimed he was a Vietnam veteran and didn't get closer to than Germany and all that sort of stuff. There's plenty of them. And, and we, we had a, it was a, it was an American president who won a Pulitzer Prize for a book that somebody else wrote. So uh, <laughs> well, uh, there's been plenty of us. Now we haven't talked about electric vehicles for a while, Jack. And, oh, yeah. um, and, and I noticed that. Um, uh, for all it'll the, the support it'll be, it'll for this the death sort of, of Elon Musk, trust me. For, for all the support for this sort of thing in the Australian Parliament, only three Australian parliamentarians have chosen electric vehicle as their free car. Well, let me tell you, there's an explanation for that, Jack, and it goes back to the previous government that basically said um, uh, that, that Commonwealth vehicles, not just for politicians, but also including those provided to politicians, uh, will all be hybrids. And that was uh, down to uh, that uh, great statesman of our times, Angus Taylor. Um, and so you'll find virtually every uh, every Commonwealth vehicle now um, is, is you know, the, the, not, not at the very top end where they've got the boomers, but... Um, but down to the, <laughs> the shallower end, uh, you'll find that they are Toyota Camry hybrids. No, well, that's not what the parliamentarians are choosing. They all, nearly all chose oh, when, oh, when we're talking about private car, well, yeah, because uh, didn't they make a big fuss about uh, the member for Warringah driving around in an SUV or something? Mm. It's we used to have to when I when I got a free car from the Commonwealth and, and under the same terms as the parliamentarians do, uh, we had to choose one that was manufactured in Australia. But, but in those days, we did manufacture we didn't. cars. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a bit, bit tricky now, and, and that's why, as I say, the pointy end. And all the cops are driving around in BM, in Beamers now. <laughs> They're having a lovely time of it. Um, yeah. So look, I'm just uh, just to wrap up, uh, Mr. Sanders, he's also wanted in Brazil. Jack. Um, so, Who's that? Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, George Santos is also President want- Santos. Yeah. Yeah, he's also wanted in Brazil, but not in a good way. Yeah. Um, so, so he might have to uh, pop along there and uh, answer some fairly serious charges there. It's been great to catch up again. Well, and- I... I better pop along to Bookazine, I suppose, and pick up my copy of the book. <laughs> you can uh, just. I, I, I have got some news for you, though. If, if our listeners want to find me, they can find me on sub, Substack, Hong Kong Jack at Substack.com. Oh, really? Hong Kong Jack oh, Substack.com. This is, this is all news. And we've got some of your meanderings here. Yeah, no, like, and I can, I can put a comment up there. Oh, no it's, just, it's a Substack, so you'll have your Twitter thing there. And oh, I so say, yes, I know what a Substack is now. I uh, completely. If they, if they, lost if they my want mind. to leave some nasty comments, just find me on Substack. Oh, dear. I don't know if, you, <laughs> if that's what you really want, Jack. We've got some feisty listeners, and we thank them. Yeah, that's right. We thank them for, for tuning in uh, uh, again. Uh, we've uh, very much enjoyed uh, bringing this show back to you. Joel and I will be back. Shortly, I don't know when he's back from Europe, wandering, wandering the continent. Um, but uh, but uh, yes, we'll be back next week uh, and continuing on throughout the year. Hong Kong, Jack and I <coughs> in uh, our around the world and back again program. Um, and uh, we th- want to thank you too, Jack, for your time today. It's been great to get you out of slumber and illness. And uh, and got you get you back. It's just you know it's just a, that first hard day, hard day's uh, uh, graft, and you're through it now. Yeah, I'll be keen to buy the froth off one shortly. Excellent work, mate. We we have had a late start today. Thank you very much, and thank you, listeners. And uh, if you uh, do want to drop uh, Jack a line, um, threatening or otherwise, uh, you can hit him up on his Substack, and uh, you can of course hit me up on Twitter. Oh, my DMs are always open. I'll be remaining on Twitter for a little while, but I'm just about out of gut full of Elon Musk, I've got to tell you. Anyway, um, we'll be back next week. And until then, uh, take care and be good. See ya.